Job chapter 18, we'll go through three chapters tonight. We've been going through several chapters each and every night. It's working out well. But you know, man, to go through these chapters and finally get to, uh, you know, to chapter 30, 38, and 37, 38 and stuff, man, it's a battle, isn't it? And, you know, the bottom line here is we have not seen a lot of compassion from Job's friends. We've not seen any compassion at all. Compassion. Compassion is the response to the suffering of others that motivates a desire to help. That's a basic definition of compassion. In other words, when we see a need, we see something, we see someone that's got a, a hurt foot or something, we have compassion, and so we go over and we, and we try to attend to that person. Or if we see something that has happened, uh, someone has dropped something, we have a bit of compassion, we go over and we try to help them. Help them out. Assist them. You know, we, we don't go up and say, boy, that was really stupid that you dropped the eggs. We don't say that. That's not compassion. Or that was really dumb that you tripped over that curb and broke your foot. That's, that's, that's not compassion. And sometimes when we're not thinking and, and, and when we're with people that we love or are close to, sometimes those sorts of things come out of our mouth and it's wrong. And of course, the minute it comes out, we just kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that all about? But we've got to be careful here. But here we see that these men, Job's friends, they have not had a desire, they have not been motivated by compassion at all. We remember the first several days, the first seven days, the men came and they sat and they were just astonished at the appearance of their friends. And now in the sheer destitute that he had seemed to be in for seven days, they just put their hands over their mouths. And really that was the most compassionate thing they had done the whole time. But now several days has go have gone by. Several days have turned into weeks. And as we've been going through these chapters, these guys are just laying it on Job, aren't they? Wow, Job, you know, you're wicked. You've got hidden sin. Confess your sin. The Lord will... Well, we'll bless you, but you but you don't want to confess your hidden sin, and there's nothing further from the truth. We remember in chapters one and two that the Lord God said to Satan himself, "Hey, Satan, have you seen anyone more righteous than my man Job?" And Satan couldn't disagree. He didn't disagree. He challenged the Lord. He said, "Lord, if you took your hand off this guy, he'd curse you to his face." And the Lord was saying, "No, he won't." And so that's why, that's how Job is finding himself in this predicament, although he doesn't know it. He has no idea, the poor guy. And so Job is having his ups and downs. He's having some tough days sometimes where he just really wants to just, you know, hey, let me die. And then there's other days, as we'll see this, this evening, that he says, hey, I know that God is still real. I mean, he may, he may have something against me that he's not revealing right now. And this is Job's ignorance. He say, he, he's got something against me right now that he's not sharing with me, but you know what? He's still God. That's the amazing thing about this book. And we have got to leave this book every, every Wednesday night and just say, man, I thought I was having a tough day today, but I certainly am not. Right? I mean, I hope we're walking away with that kind of an attitude. If we're not, you better check your, your heartbeat. I mean, are you really alive? So these men had no compassion. They had no motivation to help. In Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah, in Lamentations 3.32, Jeremiah speaks concerning the nation of Israel, though he causes grief, in other words, though the Lord causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. So the Lord is full of compassion. Jeremiah is speaking about this, his beloved nation Israel, his country Israel, after it had been absolutely wiped out. And Jeremiah is lamenting over the destroyed Israel, the nation of Israel, but yet Jeremiah is saying that the Lord, he is still compassionate. As he's watching his family, his friends, his loved ones all being carted off by the Assyrians, anything that was left standing was smoldering at this time. And yet Jeremiah was saying, the Lord will show compassion. 
The psalmist writes to us in Psalm 86, verse 15, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion. I don't like it when the translations say, a God, because when I read that, I say to myself, well, that's a God that I would invent. I can't invent God, because He's full of compassion. I just invent little puny gods that are limited. And so when I read this, I, I like to read it, but you, O Lord, are the God full of compassion. Not a God that I can invent. It's imp you're impossible for me to invent. Finally, 1 Peter. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, brethren, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. In other words, under your circumstances and your situations, be motivated. Do something. Be involved. Ask, what, Lord, what should I do here? What do I, what do I, how do I need to get involved in this circumstance? And that's what these ideas are giving to us. And we're going to see the exact opposite now as we pick up at verse 1. Compassionless men and compassionless Bildad, verse 1, the, the Shuhite, answered Job. Job had just finished a diatribe, and now Bildad has just got a mouth off, of course. You can't just sit and listen and ponder to what Job... Uh, upon what Job had just said. So he's got to pop off in verse, in verse 2. How long till you put an end to words? Job, when are you going to shut up? Gain understanding, Job, and afterward we will speak. I mean, we are so brilliant, Job, you just don't have any clue. I mean, isn't, isn't this amazing? I mean, it just keeps getting repeated, regurgitated, recycled over and over. I mean, here we are in chapter 18 and nothing has changed. These men are still piling on poor Job. Why are we, Job, counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight? Nothing can be further from the truth. You who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you? Or shall the rock be moved from its place? The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his, of his fire does not shine. So here we go back again, that these guys, and here Bildad, it's Bildad's turn, trying to, to, to understand, or make Job understand, Job, I know you're wicked. Now again, there's nothing further from the truth. God has ordained, has, has proclaimed this man as righteous. But yet here Bildad is saying, well, Job, there's... You're a wicked man. And it, that's wrong. And so in verse 6, the light is dark in his tent, speaking of the wicked. And his lamp beside him is put out. The steps of his strength are shortened, and his own counsel casts him down. He continues describing the wicked. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walks into a snare. The net takes him by the heel, and a snare lays hold of him. A noose is hidden for him on the ground, and a trap for him in the road. Terrors frighten the wicked man on every side and drive him to his feet. His strength is starved, and destruction is ready at his side. It devours patches of his skin. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. He is uprooted from the shelter of his tent, and they parade him before the king of terrors. They dwell in his tent, who are none of his. Brimstone is scattered on his dwelling. The wicked's roots are dried out below, and his branch withers above. The memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name among the renowned. He is driven from light into darkness and chased out of the world. He has neither son nor posterity among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. Now, this is starting to get personal now, isn't it? Because as we recall, Job lost his, his sons and daughters. And so Bildad is really piling on here. Verse 20, those in the west are astonished at his day. 
and those in the east are frightened. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. So Bildad is leveling his accusation. Face it, Job, we all know you're wicked, but you've been holding out all these days. All these days that have surely by now turned into weeks. And so Bildad is saying, come on, fess up. Fess up. And so Job responds in chapter 19. Then Job answered and said, verse 2, How long will you torment my soul? Hey, friend of mine, my miserable comforter, how long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with your words? Does it ever end? These ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you have wronged me. And if, and if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. And Job is saying very poetically, hey, if I've made a mistake, the Lord will correct me. But what I need from you, brother, is a hand is an encouraging word, but I don't find it. If indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me, which is what his buddies have been doing, now then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. If I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. The Lord has fenced up my way so I cannot pass. And God has set darkness in my paths. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. My hope he has uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me and he counts me as one of his enemies, and let's be reminded, this is not the Lord God, this is Satan himself. And we've got to be reminded of that. But Job has no idea. He's making assumptions. He knows nowhere else to go. And so he's kind of laying this at the Lord's doorstep, but it's not correct. And you and I, we know that because we know the, the foreground of the story. But Job continues, and, and we can't blame him. I'm not trying to, uh, to blame him in any, by any means. But he continues, the Lord's troops come together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. So Job is starting to take an inventory of his family and his friends, and, and then we'll, we'll get an inventory here in a moment of his wife. My relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is even offensive to my own wife. Remember when wifey in chapter 2 said, Hey, Job. Here's a suggestion for you. Curse God and die. Well, that's the wife you want hanging around your place, right? Thank God for our wives, fellas. Praise the Lord. My breath is offensive to my wife, and I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. Can you imagine that? Uh, I imagine this in my mind. Uh, and Job's not traveling much, but I imagine in my mind, here's Job kind of walking around town and kids are playing on the sidewalk or whatever. They look up and they see Job in this horrific condition. And the kids just jump up ah, and they run away. You know? And that's what Job is saying. Now even young children despise me. Nobody wants to be around me. And yet this is the comfort that you have ferreted up for me. And so this is the response. I mean, Job is just, I mean, can you imagine his hope is just going, you know, down, down. But again, he gets raised back up, but he's just really kind of in a bummer right now. Again, we can't blame him at all. I arise and they speak against me. 
All my close friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Won't you have pity on me? Have pity on me, oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Now again, let's give credit where it's due. It's Satan himself. Well, let's give credit where it belongs. Why do you persecute me? Why do you guys persecute me as God does? And are not satisfied with my flesh. I mean, isn't it enough that I'm in the condition that I'm in that you don't have to keep piling on? This is, these are Job's questions. Oh, that my words were written. And oh, how, if they were inscribed in the book. Well, this is what they would read as follows as if they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and, and lead forever. This is what they would read, verse 25. Job's word, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Even in Job's lowest of low, he musters enough faith given by the Lord Himself, but he knows my Redeemer lives. Wherever it is or wherever, it's you, wherever you've been or wherever it's you, you're headed, never forget this verse 25, chapter 19. I know that my Redeemer lives. We are going to have our ups and downs. I don't believe anyone here is ordained to have a lifestyle that, that Job was, was uh, given. I hope we don't. We may sometimes feel like we have. <laughs> but the bottom line is we need to be reminded that and know that our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer lives and He shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, that, it, that this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole, and not another. Don't ever let that, that hope fade away from you. Because that that's makes the difference between a born-again Christian and someone that's just wandering through this world. Is that we have the hope that our Redeemer lives. That's what gets us through predicaments, doesn't it? It's okay to, to say, yes, it, it is all right. We've gotten through just by knowing, Lord, I know you're good. I don't quite understand what's going on here. I'll be honest with you, Lord, I don't like what's going on here, but I do know, Lord, you're in charge. How many times did we say that last night while we were glued <laughs> to the screen? Lord, we know you're in charge, but please! <laughs> it's okay. But we know that the Lord is good. We do know that. And sometimes we kind of find ourselves that we've put ourselves in certain predicaments. And He kind of lets us saute there a little bit, if you will. Always having a hand on the control of the, the, the flame control, the heat control. But there are times we, we end up putting ourselves in certain scenarios. One time, <laughs> and I'm sure my dad will deny this, but uh, one time when I, I was about uh, yeah, 10, 10, 11 years old, we were always at the beach. We lived up in the mountains, and so every summer we'd come down to the beach, spend the, week, spend the summer at the beach. One time my younger brother was out uh, in the waves, and he got caught in the, the riptide. And uh, I had just come out, and I sat down, and I was kind of next to my dad, and I looked out, and I saw my brother out there kind of, hey, you know, you know, type thing. And we all swam really well. And uh, I looked at my dad, I said, hey, um, dad, do you think you can, are you going to help Brad? And he looked out there and he said, well, he's been kind of a wise guy this week. <laughs> so I'm going to leave him out there for another minute. <laughs> this is my dad, great guy, great guy. When we got in fights, I mean, we got in fights. And we tore the thing, we tore the house down. He just watched the whole time. And we'd be bloody and busted and eyeballs hanging out and legs flopping around. You say, okay, you guys all done? Yeah, yeah, I'm all done. All right, go out and sweep the driveway now. You know? Things like that. 
All that to say, that's not the way the Lord acts. But he does allow certain things to kind of get our attention. And he's always got his hand on us. He loves us very much. He's always in control. He's always monitoring. He knows exactly where we're at. And so we need to understand, recognize, and remember that. So my Redeemer lives, and we drop down to the second half of verse 27. How my heart yearns within me, Job continues. If you should say, how shall we persecute him? In other words, those around him, you ask how, you, how I should be persecuted, Job asking. Since the root of the matter is found in me, be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Job is reminding his friends, and Paul speaks to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, really just repeating out of Deuteronomy. But Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19, the Lord speaking, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. And so Job is cautioning, you guys are here trying to correct me or put me under some sort of a judgment you better be very careful because the Lord, not only is He my Redeemer and not only does He live, He is also my judge. So be very cautious, fellas. So the whole time that Job is getting piled on, he is bringing quality counsel throughout our lengthy conversation here. It's an amazing thing. Job just is... His ability to stay focused on the Lord is absolutely incredible. And that's what the Lord wants us to get out of this. It can be a brutal book. You know, I'm, I spend all week with, the, with these scriptures. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, help me out here. Just, just keep digging in. You'll find what I have for you. And so I always ask the Lord, Lord, teach me so I can teach yours. Is that a deal, Lord? The Lord always says, that's a great deal. So teach me first, Lord. So I can teach you words. Let's finish up with chapter 20. It'll go quick. So Job finishes up. Zophar now. Bildad, just, we just heard from Bildad a minute ago. We just now finished hearing from Job. Now, Zophar, he can't contain himself. He's got to start piping up now. I mean, it's just a real party here, right? So Zophar, Zophar the Namathite, answered and said... And I love this. My anxious thoughts make me answer. I mean, there's no self-control here at all. He's like a 12-year-old kid. He can't sit still for more than 15 minutes. My anxious thoughts make me answer because of the turmoil within me. I mean, where's the Spirit of God in this guy? Obviously, nowhere near. I have heard the rebuke that reproaches me, he continues, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. I'm so brilliant, in other words, I just can't control my brilliance, is what he's saying. I've got to pipe up. Do you not know this of old, since man was placed on earth, that the, tr the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? And so, here's Zophar piling on again, making the accusation of saying, Job, you're a wicked man. So he's showing how foolish he is by what? Opening his mouth. If he'd have kept his mouth shut, he'd have fooled everybody in the room. But he confirmed he was a fool by opening his mouth. Though his haughtiness mounts up to the heavens and his head reaches the clouds, yet he will perish forever like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, he will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him anymore. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hands will restore his wealth. This is, I don't like the way this was translated. I'd like to take a second with this. In verse 10, speaking of the wicked man, when the wicked man falls into hard times, the, wicked's man, the wicked man's children will seek favor of the poor and 
the wicked man's children will restore what was taken from the poor, is what's trying to be translated here. And so what, 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 uh, what the Zophar is saying, the wicked man's children will seek to befriend the poor who's been taken advantage of. So in order to get an audience with the poor man's children, they'll restore what supposedly they had taken. That, that's that's the, uh, the, uh, the translation here. I didn't like the way the, uh, uh, the, the New King James put it, so I, I hopefully that timed it out a little bit. Anyway, continuing in the wicked man, verse 11, his bones are full of his youthful vig vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Though evil is sweet in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue, though he spares it and does not forsake it, but still keeps it in his mouth, yet his food in his stomach turns sour. It becomes cobra venom within him. The wicked man swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. The wicked will suck the poisons of cobras. The viper's tongue will slay him. The wicked will not see the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. The wicked will restore that for which he labored, but will not swallow it down. From the proceeds of business, he will get no enjoyment. For he has oppressed and forsaken the poor. He has violently seized a house which he did not build. So in other words, uh, Zophar here is explaining the, the wicked man is so full of guilt that he won't enjoy the spoil that he steals. That's, that's what he's trying to, to paint here. Verse 20, because he knows no quietness in his heart, the wicked man, he will not save anything he desires. Nothing is left for him to eat. Therefore, his well-being will not last. In his self-sufficiency, he will be in distress. Every hand of misery will come against him. When he is about to fill his stomach, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath, and, it will, and will rain it on him while he is eating. He will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce him through. It is drawn and comes out of the body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terror, terrors come upon him. Total darkness is reserved for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. It shall go ill with him who is left in his tent. The heavens will reveal his iniquity, and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will depart, and his goods will flow away in the days day of his wrath. This is the portion from God for a wicked man, the heritage appointed to him by God. And so as we close tonight, we see that once again, this miserable counsel, along with all of his buddies and Bildad so, so far, and all the others that have basically gathered around now, I believe that there's a good group of folks uh, in this circle by now, because this is actually turning into some sort of entertainment as we've touched on earlier. But so far, it is suggesting once again, as we close tonight, that Job, you're a wicked man. And the reason you've lost everything is because you hid your wickedness well from us, your buddies, but you can't hide it from God. So this is why you're going through this turmoil. And of course, this is the furthest thing, as we know, this is the furthest thing from the truth. If I could ask the worship team to join me. These final verses tonight that we've read are exactly what not to do. <laughs> when someone is hurting, this is not what we do. We do not start piling on. What we do is when someone is hurting, as we 
touched on earlier as we began, is we need to be motivated to help. And when we're motivated to help, that is compassion. And that's what the Lord expects from us. That's what the Lord is expecting from Job's comforters here. But they're not, they're not coming to that conclusion. And we'll see in, in, toward, in, in a few more weeks that when the Lord does begin to speak, that He is not happy with the way these men have come alongside. Come alongside. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father God, for allowing us to come together in your presence. We thank you, Lord, to have a description to understand what not to do. And Father God, filled with your Holy Spirit, we ask you to allow us to do the right thing. And we know that through you, Father God, that we will be able to let you work through us. The gifts that we ask for, Lord, are all so important, but yet the most important of these is love. So we ask you to teach us love, Father God. And so as we lead not on our own understanding tonight, Father God, we ask you to reveal yourself in a mighty way. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.